Uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, hello again. My name is Jonathan Victor. I lead a lot of our ecosystem growth at Protocol Labs, just helping people think about how to use IPFS and Filecoin. Today, I'm joined by this wonderful panel. Um, I'll let each panelist sort of introduce themselves. So we have Stanny, Kevin, Moses, uh, three fantastic organizations. So maybe, yeah, to kick it off, if you want to each give maybe a one-minute introduction about yourselves, your organizations, uh, yeah, and your sort of respective missions. Sure. So uh, my name is Stanny Kulachov. I'm, I'm the um, founder and CEO of um, Aave. Um, Aave is a team that built the Aave protocol, uh, which is a decentralized liquidity protocol where you can uh, supply your cryptographic assets um, uh, into a smart contract-based protocol without giving up your custody and earn yield. And you can use those assets as a collateral as well to draw uh, liquidity. So the Aave protocol is uh, deployed on multiple uh, networks, um, Ethereum, uh, Polygon, Avalanche, uh, Arbitrum, um, and Optimism, for example. Um, and it's uh, one of the um, rarest uh, protocols that, it, that is also um, governed with a cross-chain um, community um, governance. And it's securing across all of these protocols roughly from 5 to 15 uh, billion worth of value uh, in total. And uh, we recently also um, uh, built the Lens protocol, which is a decentralized social media protocol. So where Aave's, Aave protocol is bringing access to, to finance and, and global uh, markets, Lens is uh, providing access to your own uh, social networks and uh, social uh, identity uh, on chain. And super excited to be here. Uh, hi, uh, this is Kevin Law, uh, the business development at Matrix Spot. So uh, at Matrix Spot, we are one integrated crypto solution provider in support of prime blockage, uh, custodian, DeFi, and CeFi trade, as long as the uh, NFT storage as well. So uh, for, uh, we, have, we are one of the very few that are uh, in support of the uh, CeFi and DeFi together for our custodian service. So, so uh, we have about uh, 26 DeFi products on board, and which include uh, Falcon. And then uh, for the Falcon that we support, like the sticking product, and also like the borrowing and lending as well. So uh, in case that uh, we have anything that uh, related to Falcon usage, that we can in support of all the ecosystem activities. Great. Now, hi. Anchorage Digital is purpose-built for institutions to participate in digital assets. We are the first US regulated crypto bank and we offer custody, trading, financing, as well as on-chain services, such as staking and governance. Amazing. Well, maybe to kick it off with Moses and Kevin, so pre-FVM, the world that we live in with Filecoin is to sort of meet the needs that storage providers and other entities that are looking for Filecoin to make productive use of that Filecoin by offering storage providing services. Uh, they need to get access to capital, and both of your firms work really closely with a bunch of storage providers to sort of enable that. And I'm curious, given where we are, sort of like the state of the market uh, as it is today, what do you see as currently the biggest challenges, biggest opportunities, uh, yeah, and places where uh, you see there's opportunity? Sure, I'll go. Um, so, first of all, I'm really energized to see the Falcon community gather together and have so much input from the various parts of the community. Um, so some of the challenges, I guess, we can talk about uh, for storage providers that we see from our side would be timing. So storage providers have an enorm enormous amount of investment that they have to do. They have to procure hardware. They have to procure the data centers to install the hardware. On top of that, they have to pledge. And so um, with that, you also have the pledging part, supply constraints. So storage providers have the choice to either purchase the file to pledge and seal, or they can choose to borrow and use financing. So with that, at the current stage, the challenging part is to time your installations as well as procuring the Filecoin to actually participate in the Filecoin network? Uh, I think for my end, that uh, I think the uh, market uh, for the Falcon lending and borrowing is a bit, uh, a bit new. And then the timing-wise may not be that. Uh, the, I think the market competency is yet uh, building up. 
uh, especially for the uh, looking for external liquidity. But uh, we, uh, after the, uh, lo the, the ETH uh, merged, that uh, we see actually more and more demand from the uh, Filecoin miners that going for the staking and then looking for external liquidity or the uh, Filecoin uh, to borrow for the staking activity. So uh, we actually see increasing the demand from that. And we are also looking to source for uh, uh, external uh, look validated in terms of partnership for the sticking uh, activity as well. I guess maybe as a follow on, I'm curious from your guys' side more on the supply side of the loan. So thinking also about like the institutional sentiment as we're sort of moving in towards like a bear market, what are you guys sort of observing on the ground there? How do you sort of see things materializing? Has that changed uh, the lending like services that your teams are sort of like uh, putting together? Yeah, what have you guys sort of observed? Sure. From the storage provider's perspective, and especially those that utilize financing, it's a tremendous tool because for Anchorage's Filecoin program, everything is denominated in Filecoin. So what that does for storage providers is it insulates from the dollar price movement. So while the hardware as well as the data center is denominated and paid in fiat, at least the pledge part is isolated and it grows with the Filecoin ecosystem. And it is absolutely earned and paid back in Filecoin, which helps the, the Filecoin miners, uh, storage providers, reduce the volatility of price impact and extend the runway. Yeah, I think uh, for, for us that uh, we see the, um, the, the one that are looking for more sticking product so uh, at our trading mobile trading app that we, you can, one can uh, do for like a deposit and also uh, borrowing the uh, uh, Falcon for the flexi staking purpose. So uh, we try to provide more flexibility for those miners to, to, um, to, to accelerate the using of uh, Falcon to do the uh, storage business as well. Well, maybe, Stanny, to turn it over to you. So one thing that's been fascinating to me is seeing, we see it in the Ethereum ecosystem, MakerDAO working with, like, using a maker with real-world assets as an example. I think one of the cool things about Filecoin is we have, like, real-world services to some degree. And, I mean, you probably see this, too, to some degree with Lens as well, where as we have other things that are anchoring on chain, you have this ability now to marry DeFi primitives and things that sort of exist in the, the financial economy on chain with other services that sort of exist. And I'm curious, are there any things that you particularly are interested in or keeping an eye on as we see more and more things happening on chain and having the ability to tap into DeFi primitives that also live on chain? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a big potential um, uh, real world asset. So I, I, I think, I mean, just looking at what is already tokenized as real world assets, that's uh, pretty much US dollar at the moment. So um, USDC is, is one of like a prime examples how you can actually go in scale of, of tokenizing real world assets, but that's just uh, one particular um, instrument. So you have basically cash at uh, bank accounts. Uh, but there is more interesting things that you can actually um, uh, tokenize as well and, and provi provide that liquidity into a decentralized financial infrastructure. And, and for example, debt is, is one of them. So tokenizing credit, um, centrifuge is, is one of interesting companies working on, on, on basically getting um, credit markets into DeFi. Um, and there is actually one uh, market, uh, Aave market, that is done uh, together with the uh, centrifuge community where um, you can actually use those uh, credit receivables um, as a collateral to borrow uh, liquidity on a separate Aave market. So I think there is sort of uh, potential there. Um, the Aave community is, is also uh, launching the Go stablecoin, and, and part of the Go stablecoin is that um, they have different kinds of facilitators. So obviously the first facilitator is to mint uh, Go against uh, the main Ethereum market that we, we have, but down the line, a facilitator can actually be uh, an entity from real world that actually um, uh, provides some sort of uh, uh, credit uh, as, as well. And I think like down the line, what's going to be very fascinating is that how you can actually use uh, data in providing in under collateralized loans. Um, and this is where the kind of like a middleware uh, data storage and data infrastructure comes to place, because the more you have data, uh, the more you can use it um, in a very kind of like a um, value added way to the user. 
um, you can use that data for uh, facilitating credits uh, on chain. And I think that's where most kind of like a fascinating use cases come to the um, under collateralized um, lending when you can actually use the data that is available off chain and, and combine it with on, ch on chain data uh, and provide uh, credit. And DeFi is actually like a perfect infrastructure to, uh, for credit markets because uh, by design, DeFi is global. So everyone kind of like has the fair equal access to, to, to the same financial opportunity. Um, and you have this kind of like a global liquidity pool. And, and now, kind of, now what's very fascinating is that there's a lot of projects thinking of like how you can get that liquidity out of DeFi and uh, finance uh, real world uh, use cases and, and financing opportunities. And I, I think there's where uh, data layers um, come into place and, and, and specifically Filecoin. That's awesome. Well, I mean, one of the things that you sort of mentioned under collateralized lending when I think about like, the work that Kevin and Moses, your teams are doing, like today, because we don't have these primitives, a lot of them are sort of like using the on-chain mechanics that we have, like multi-sigs and things like that, to sort of lend out to miners and do the rest. Uh, I'm curious, and maybe, Kevin, this is a good question for your team, since you straddle on the CeFi and DeFi side, uh, how are you guys thinking about the FVM? Are you thinking about like, building permissionless protocols to be able to do that sort of like staking process, uh, moving some of the things that you might be managing yourselves today and turn that into protocols themselves, which then could tap into broader, uh, broader pools of capital, both for the miners who might want to participate as well as for the like, other retail folks who maybe want to put capital into these systems. Um, maybe I, I add a little bit of things. So uh, like, uh, despite the, like, the crypto winter, that Matrix is still very keen to uh, optimize our infrastructure in terms of the CFI and DeFi. So uh, we have around like seven plus for the CFI exchange in partnership uh, for lending and borrowing, also like the prime brokerage business. Uh, for the DeFi one, we have uh, 10 plus for the EVM chains and like uh, 26 protocol uh, in support. So actually this helped a lot for the uh, uh, DeFi participant and also uh, user that try to leverage between both CFI and DeFi uh, for the cross up trading. And also uh, in terms of like the custodian, they can make use of our, like the DeFi, DeFi uh, app connector to connect with those like storage and borrowing uh, between the DeFi into our custodian platform. Yeah, we, we see actually seeing uh, growing demand and also inquiry for, uh, for doing these kind of cross arbitrage activities. Actually, maybe also to ask on the Anchorage side, uh, given how you guys sort of run your operations today, are you guys looking at anything with the FEM in terms of opening up access to make it possible to serve more and more folks on the mining side or in terms of making, obviously, as a regulated bank, maybe it's a little bit harder to just take deposits from anyone. Um, but how, are you guys thinking about any of that stuff? Uh, any investigations on that front? Sure. As a crypto native technology company first, that happens to also be a bank, we're very excited about the FBM and what it could promise for the ecosystem. However, at this point in time, it's very challenging for institutions to participate in DeFi. And so we'll have to see and do a wait and see approach because it also marries in with regulatory requirements that are still very unclear. Well, actually, maybe, Stanny, I know your team has thought a lot about the institutional side and what does it mean to make DeFi protocols that are like make it possible to like allow institutions to participate. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on sort of where things are going on that front, especially given I know in the US there's quite a lot going on on the regulatory side these days. Yeah, I'm just curious about your perspective on what are like yeah the biggest challenges and opportunities ahead. Yeah, I, I think uh, the institutional side has has been something that we've been um, thinking uh, for quite a decent amount of time. So. Um, I think it was like almost a year and a half ago when uh, we started working together with, with Fireblocks, which is um, a kind of like a, I would say like a institutional gateway into um, uh, DeFi as well. So you can have multiple party computation, uh, security and access uh, these protocols, DeFi protocols in non-custodial custodial way. And what we noticed that uh, some of the institutional customers, um, they were a bit more hesitant on um, using decentralized finance in, in the current state because uh, mainly, you know, even if there's a lot of like eagerness within the uh, within the company and in the institution, um, there might not be like enough uh, regulatory clarity for 
for these teams to, to actually go in and uh, uh, ape into the uh, permissionless uh, DeFi uh, protocols. So what we created was uh, the Aave Arc market, and, and effectively it's the same uh, smart contract-based infrastructure that we have um, in, in, in many of the networks that uh, Aave is deployed, but the key difference is that there's this, um, uh, fun, uh, like, I would say, like a um, uh, part that is called the, the, the whitelisters, and the whitelisters, they can uh, whitelist uh, the uh, uh, suppliers and the borrowers and, and the liquidators, um, and they have a common process that actually you have to go uh, to get KYC, and after that, you can actually uh, get whitelisted into the ARC market. So it's uh, effectively a, a uh, sandbox and environment where you can use all the benefits from decentralized finance. So you have um, the transparency that you, you get from public blockchain, uh, smart contract-based execution, um, and, and the non-custodial uh, access within uh, your team. And uh, to be honest, uh, it's, it's been kind of like a small market uh, so far, but what we saw recently with um, all the events after most of the leverage has been wiped out in the uh, DeFi ecosystem with Free Arrow Capitals and, and BlockFi and Celsius, what we realized that actually there is more demand uh, in this kind of like a product as Aave Arc because uh, what went wrong with the uh, CeFi side of um, things is that uh, you give up custody to, to uh, centralized uh, lending providers, and at the same time, um, you don't have visibility what is happening uh, behind of this uh, black box. So it's not different from what, what is happening necessarily in uh, Wall Street. Actually, it's even worse because you don't, you don't actually have regulation much in, in the, in the crypt, crypto space. So uh, effectively, with the Aave Arc market, you can actually securely, uh, without giving up the custody, uh, interact with um, the, the Aave protocol uh, and a, a specific market. And you have all the visibility and, and transparency of what happens in the uh, market itself. And, and most importantly, you have smart contract-based ex execution. And what we, re what we noticed with, with the centralized lending providers uh, effectively was that the only place they actually repaid, despite all of the loan agreements they had, the only place they repaid their loans was to decentralized uh, uh, protocols because you have no options because you can't bend the smart contract infrastructure. And I think that's the big value proposition for institutional DeFi because you can actually, um, you know, operate and have global financial markets um, without um, uh, kind of like a being in a position where something like that can happen where you lose the funds, you lose the custody of the funds, uh, obviously. And many of the, uh, like the uh, custodials that are dealing with the institutions are more and more interested in decentralized finance, such as uh, these two guys here. <laughs> uh, well, maybe actually to talk a little bit more on the institutional side. Uh, recently, so obviously, uh, Chairman Gensler had some words about what may or may not be a security. We won't get into there. Uh, but I'm curious, from both of your perspectives, uh, are there opportunities that you see uh, for better engagement uh, with different governments, different policymakers? What are the opportunities to better educate them on the opportunities and sort of how to think about, especially when we think about like sort of like the C, Phi, DeFi sort of like connection, uh, ways in which we can better edu like educate them and engage as a community? Um, I think with the uh, we we didn't. Uh, where, where, where are the uh, kinds coming from? But I think when when um, there is the ecosystem uh, trying to evolve and then, uh, evolve and then uh, having better use of the uh, new cases that uh, we will see uh, it will be a promising outlook for the Falcon and also for the whole ecosystem to be running. So um, that one will help also for the like the. Uh, to the Falcon itself and also in terms of like institutional or others like individual that making use of uh, Falcon to, to use for the uh, data storage or any other uh, um, like custodian platform or any other like the treasury management for that as well. So um, we, we think that is a good, a good trend for this uh, in the long run. Yeah, sure. For regulatory, we are obviously a OCC regulated bank. And so we are extensively engaging regulators at all times. I think when it comes to securities, 
Um, we need more granular guidance from the regulators. And that seems to be evolving, and I agree that we should continue our education process as well as engagement with regulators. Something I noticed, actually, which is very uh, cool what you can do with Filecoin is that if you have uh, a business built on top of uh, like decentralized infrastructure, whether it's like decentralized finance or uh, let's say the Ethereum network, like you could, uh, you could actually, uh, let's say that you are a centralized lender, you could actually periodically dump and, and publish your loan book into uh, Filecoin and it's gonna be like immutable storage which could be an interesting use case because there's also an argument where you don't necessarily need all the benefits that you have, uh, what comes with um, like smart contract based uh, protocols and you can do a lot of business like outside of the, the blockchain and, and centralized lending is one of those examples. And I think um, you know, what went wrong as well with, with the, um, some of the centralized lenders, like that could be an interesting use case to, to create transparency and, and visibility. There are some, lending firms um, globally that actually publish their uh, loan books um, publicly. Um, that could be an interesting way to, to um, create credibility, but also data points as well for the whole uh, ecosystem. Awesome. Well, that was the last question I have for you guys. Thank you all for coming.